will be by Evelyn um, Docher, and she's a second year PhD student um, finishing up her PhD at the Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. And her thesis is focusing on employing advanced um, lesion symptom mapping analysis in large data sets of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. So um, it's a recorded talk, but Evelyn will be on soon. Um, obviously, we're she's on a different time zone than us, but she will be on for questions. So we'll get started right away. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I'd just like to say a huge thank you for this opportunity to present and uh, just give a bit of a disclaimer, I guess, that I am still quite new to the world of TBI research. And so I definitely don't claim to be an expert on this topic today. However, last year I was conducting quality checking of cortical parcellations in a cohort of moderate to severe TBI patients. To understand why we need to improve our methods of dealing with TBI lesions in MRI image pre-processing, we first need to know a little bit about what has been done previously. And I am definitely oversimplifying this, but generally speaking, previous studies have done one of three things when it comes to patients with focal lesions. They have either excluded them, ignored them, or tried to deal with them. Those studies that excluded patients generally chose a lesion size threshold above which lesions were excluded. As highlighted here, however, whether these, these thresholds were not always consistent between studies. The exclusion of patients with lesions above these types of thresholds not only reduces statistical power by reducing our sample size, but it also reduces the generalizability of results by limiting our samples to only a subset of the clinical TBI population. Secondly, and I know this word ignoring is not at all the best word to use, but I only use it to highlight those cases where studies have initially included patients with large focal lesions, but have not made specific attempts to deal with the lesions prior to image pre-processing. In some cases, these lesions cause, may cause only moderate errors, resulting in the exclusion of select regions. But in other cases, such as two severe TBI patients in this study, extreme failures in automated image processing methods result again in patient exclusion. Importantly, the criteria around the type and size of errors warranting select region versus whole patient exclusion is not consistent among studies. Other studies have tried to employ post hoc correction methods to improve the lesion induced errors after pre-processing. However, a recently published study by King and colleagues has quantitatively shown that lesion induced errors occur globally. This was evidenced by distortions in volumetric calculations in the non lesioned hemisphere in unilateral synthetically lesioned images. This highlights a need to deal with TBI lesions during image pre-processing as post hoc correction methods can only deal with focally induced errors. Those TBI studies that have made some attempts to deal with focal lesions during pre-processing have used differing approaches with different accuracy trade-offs. While there have been promising developments in pre-processing tools to improve the accuracy of results in stroke and multiple sclerosis lesions, the unique heterogeneity and often bilateral nature of TBI lesions means many of these methods are not suitable, and so TBI literature has been so far limited by suboptimal methods. So today, I'm firstly going to provide an overview of the types of lesion-induced errors we see during image pre-processing when the lesions are ignored, for lack of a better word, and pushed through a standard neuroimaging pipeline. I'll then provide a brief summary on some of the methods that have been proposed to reduce these errors. And finally, I'll give an insight on where I think we should be heading in the future. The five core steps in neuroimaging pre-processing that I'll be exploring today are brain extraction, registration, normalisation, segmentation and parcellation. And although I'll be focusing on T1-weighted MRI today with my examples, much of this is applicable to other MRI modalities as well. And I'm not too sure on the experience that everyone has with neuroimaging, so I am going to focus more on the basic concepts of each step here. So my apologies to any of you who are already well read on this literature. Brain extraction, as the name would suggest, employs automated methods to, to separate brain from non-brain tissue, creating a mask of the brain only, and this is a crucial first step. 
There are quite a number of different mathematical approaches for creating this brain mask, and I'm not going to go into detail about them, but it is important to understand that brain extraction is a difficult process to get right, even in healthy brains. Methods focusing on signal intensity or looking for the longest single continuous boundary, for example, are often thrown by bright spots connecting brain and non-brain tissue, such as the optic nerve. For patients with focal lesions at the cortical surface, as is common in TBI patients, the brain boundary no longer follows the expected curvature or signal intensities, and this results in either non-brain tissue being incorrectly included within the mask or brain tissue being incorrectly excluded from the mask. These errors are not restricted to the lesioned area, but are also likely to affect the brain mask in the immediate surrounding healthy tissue. Automated image registration searches for the optimal spatial transformation, which will change one image, called the source, to make it as similar as possible to another image, the target image. This is essential for aligning MRI scans from the same patient, which have been acquired at different time points, or scans that are acquired using different MRI modalities, as shown here. For multiple for multimodal image co-registration, there is usually an objectively perfect solution as the brain size and shape are the same, only the position within the reference frame has been altered. However, for scans taken months or years apart, the brain structure and volume is likely to have changed, especially after traumatic injury, and so registration becomes more complex. There are two main categories of image registration methods. Simple linear registration methods apply a small set of transforms e transformations equally over the whole brain, preserving anatomical relationships. Linear registrations are quite robust to the presence of lesions. However, they result in only a crude matching between the source and target images, and therefore lack the specificity that we desire. On the other hand, non-linear registration calculates and performs a huge number of different transforms at different regions based on how much the source and target images differ at those points. While non-linear registration methods are widely considered as superior to linear registrations in healthy subjects, they can be heavily influenced by the presence of focal lesions. In order to try and overcome their individual limitations, it has become common to perform an initial linear registration to provide an approximate fit before also using a non-linear registration to further refine the image registration. Spatial normalization is a specialized form of registration whereby the source image is matched to a group mean or standard template image. This establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence of brain regions across different individuals and is critical for enabling us to compare patient populations to healthy controls. Unlike in the simpler forms of image registration, there is never an objective perfect fit between an individual brain and a template brain. There are many different approaches to normalization and all of them have some sort of accuracy trade-off. For example, a method that focuses on aligning patterns of cortical folding is more likely to generate errors in brain volume and vice versa. In every case, the presence of a focal lesion greatly increases the difference between the individual and the template brain, thus reducing the best possible fit. As spatial normalization employs nonlinear registration, it often results in a shrinking of the lesioned area. As the algorithms try to focus, uh, as the algorithms focus on trying to produce a closer match to the target, and this lesion erosion, as can be seen from this initial image and after spatial normalization subsequently results in the distortion of surrounding healthy tissue. Now, in order to utilise the normalised images to infer something about morphological changes in the brain, the images need to be segmented. This is the process of automatically dividing the image into meaningful regions such that those voxels that are given the same label share some similar attributes, such as signal intensity. In MRI studies, image segmentation typically produces maps of grey matter, white matter, and CSF. In the presence of lesions, hypo-intensities in the grey matter, as exampled here, um, may be... In order to calculate these measures of volume and cortical thickness for specific regions of interest in the brain, images are often further segmented or parcellated into regions corresponding to an atlas that has known and correctly delineated neuroanatomical borders. FreeSurf is one of the most commonly utilized tools for providing segmentation of cortical and subcortical regions of the brain. 
And this is what I last used last year, producing the parcellation shown here. Now, FreeSurfer assumes that the images you input follow the normal patterns of neuroanatomy. And so when tissue is damaged or missing, as it is here, um, it's, FreeSurfer still attempts to identify all of the regions present in the atlas that is being utilised. So this example here uses a Desikhan Kiliani atlas, and we can see that extensive tissue loss at the orbitofrontal regions has pushed the neuroanatomical labels back to the closest regions of healthy-ish looking tissue. And so every label after that has also been distorted. In this example, it is extremely difficult to know where to begin with quality checking, and it's even more difficult to understand where the lesion-induced errors might actually end. So although that was an extreme case, there is no perfect when it comes to cortical parcellations, and this should be expected, given we know that the spatial normalisation underpinning this parcellation also doesn't have a perfect solution. Even in cortical parcellation in healthy participants, there are areas where we commonly see underestimations and areas where we commonly see overestimations. One important issue that I touched on earlier is that, to my knowledge, there seems to be no consistent criteria as to what type or size of errors should warrant particular concern or action. The Enigma Consortium, as well as Virtual Brain Grafting, have both outlined detailed methods, but there is still room within them for interpretation and therefore room for inconsistencies between studies and thus inconsistencies in results. The examples here show um, what I have combined from the Enigma and BBG methods and labelled as minor and intermediate errors. But how many minor interconnected errors, like these on the right, are needed before they should rather be classified as one intermediate error? Should all regions with minor errors be excluded? And how many overall minor or intermediate errors should warrant whole patient exclusion? I don't have the answer to this. So now that I have labored on about how TBI lesions can produce both focal and global errors at each step of image pre-processing, I'll briefly outline some of the methods that have been proposed to better deal with lesions during image pre-processing. The seven tools or methods that I'm going to outline today are all freely publicly available, and although I don't have time to provide an exhaustive review, I will try to capture some of their individual strengths and limitations in the context of TBI lesions. Recently, Isensi and colleagues used an artificial neural network trained on both healthy brain scans as well as patient scans from a neuro-oncology sample to improve brain extraction in the presence of pathology. Their new method, termed H. DBET was shown to outperform six other popular brain extraction tools. HDBET was not only robust in the presence of pathology, but was unaffected by variations in MRI hardware or acquisition parameters, and can also be used with a range of MRI sequences. Cost function masking was one of the first attempts to improve registration accuracy in patients with focal lesions. CFM requires the input of a mask of the lesioned area areas and uses it to tell the registration algorithm to ignore those regions when calculating the spatial transformation. The registration is then based only on the healthy tissue, reducing the overall difference between the source and target image. The accuracy of CFM, however, reduces significantly when lesion size increases. Consider this patient. If we tell the registration algorithm to ignore all lesioned areas shown by this mask, then the amount of data points it has available to match to the target image is significantly reduced and will be limited from generating the precise matching that we are striving for. Lesion filling is one proposal that can overcome this main limitation of data omission in CFM. By, uh, lesion filling works by replacing the lesioned area with the signal intensities that would be expected at that location in healthy tissue thus giving registration algorithms more data points that should create a closer match to the target image. One of the most commonly utilised methods of lesion filling is an anti-morphic normalisation, which utilises a subject's own contralateral hemisphere um, to fill in the lesioned region. An anti-morphic normalisation relies on assumptions of brain symmetry, and while we do know that asymmetries exist, it is arguable whether these errors would be greater 
than those introduced if we were filling from a template image. Unfortunately, because this method requires a non-lesion hemisphere, it is only suitable for unilateral lesions, so it's not ideal for use in TBI populations where bilateral lesions are common. SPM's clinical toolbox employs a different approach to improving normalization, utilizing the unified segmentation method initially proposed by Ashburner and Friston in 2005. This method is based on the understanding that normalization and segmentation exist in a virtuous cycle, whereby improved normalization leads to improved segmentation, which in turn improves normalization. The unified method combines both normalization, segmentation, and bias correction into a single generative model and uses a priori maps of gray matter, white matter, and CSF based on a population of healthy adults to improve the first step in normalization. Although the clinical toolbox does not require the input of a lesion mask, it does have an option for including one, and this has been shown to improve its accuracy. It also has an option for lesion filling, which is performed using an antimorphic registration. Although the unified segmentation method can be used on bilaterally lesion patients, the final templates used in SPM's clinical toolbox have been designed to be symmetrical, which is optimised for unilaterally Automatically, automatic lesion identification, or ALI for short, is a method for, you guessed it, automatically segmenting lesions. To re and this reduces the time-consuming practice of manual lesion delineation. ALI also uses a modified unified segmentation method, which allows for the classification of an extra tissue class assigned to abnormal or lesioned areas. ALI was originally developed by Sagir and colleagues in 2008, but has since been revised in 2013 in a recursive format. This latest ALI uses tissue maps of the first estimate of the extra tissue class and then utilises them as a patient-specific prior to rerun and improve the segmentation. One of the major advantages of ALI is that it can be used on patients with both unilateral and bilateral lesions. MELP-EM is the only tool I have come across which has been specifically tested initially on TBI patients. MELP-EM employs a state-of-the-art registration tool as tested in healthy participants, but it adapts it to better deal with the types of focal lesions seen in TBI patients. One example of the type of adaptations made is a relaxation of anatomical, anatomical priors at the location of damaged or missing tissue, where we know that accurate registration is not possible. Although MELP-EM enables whole brain segmentation, the study only used qualitative assessment from expert raters to determine MELP-EM's performance against other methods in a small number of subcortical regions. In order to better appreciate the potential utility of MELP-EM, we would need to see its performance on synthetically lesioned brains using real TBI lesions inserted into healthy controls. This would provide a ground truth comparison based on the accurate segmentation of the healthy brain before lesion simulation. Recently, virtual brain grafting was introduced, addressing the need to deal specifically with bilateral lesions. Radwan and colleagues developed a complete pipeline, including the use of HDBET, to automatically detect lesion laterality and employ lesion filling either from the contralateral he contralesional hemisphere for unilaterally lesioned patients or from a template image in bilaterally lesioned subjects. VBG generated synthetically lesioned brain images from a sample of subjects with heterogeneous gliomatose lesions and compared Frecephorica and oral parcellations from the healthy brains prior to lesion simulation, which were taken as ground truth, against those parcellations created in the synthetically lesioned patients when VBG either was or was not employed. Using VBG produced both quant qualitatively and quantitatively superior parcellations. However, VBG did not have any true bilaterally lesion patients, and thus its bilateral lesion filling pipeline was tested only using unilaterally lesion images. So, in summary, what we would ideally want for TBI research is a tool that does not require the input of a time-consuming manually delineated lesion mask, but rather one which could provide us with a lesion mask which could be used in lesion symptom mapping analyses. TBI populations also must have a tool that is suitable for bilateral lesions and one that which can facilitate whole brain segmentation and parcellation as opposed to lesion segmentation only. 
The segmentation and parcelation results achieved should also be tested on ground truth using real TBI lesions simulated onto healthy brains so that we can quantitatively understand both the focal and global effects of each method. As we can see, none of the tools that I have described today tick all of the boxes, but I don't think we should be too disheartened by this. There are still a lot of ticks on this page. And I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I think we should be looking at adapting and combining methods which have been shown to work in tumours or stroke lesions and optimising them for use in TBI patients. So in conclusion, given the multiple methods available for improving image pre-processing in the presence of focal lesions, we should be striving to include all patients in our studies to improve the generalizability of our results. We now know too much about the focal and global errors induced by lesions during image pre-processing. Images with focal lesions cannot be run through standard neuroimaging pipelines. They need to be specifically addressed. We also need to be working together to create more consistent methods for quality checking and um, close to objective criteria for regions or patient exclusion as a result of persistent errors. We cannot be producing time-consuming manually delineated lesion masks for large da data sets, but nor can we be utilising inaccurate automated methods in lesion symptom mapping analyses. Therefore, in the interim, we need to adopt semi-automated lesion delineation methods. And lastly, we need to continue to develop image pre-processing tools which are specifically designed and optimised for use in TBI patients. Very quickly, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to my team and external colleagues who have been instrumental in progressing my work so far. And there are many more names that I could not fit on this slide also. Thank you. All right. Great, thank you everyone for a great talk. I don't know if you, there you are. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, I guess, over there. Right. Um, so I have a couple questions, so I can, I'll get right into it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first questions is, do you think any of the pipelines you mentioned will work on scans in the first two weeks after injury in the presence of hemorrhagic lesion, lesions? Mm. Yeah, so I think all of the pipelines um, would be able to work um, like on, a, on acute scans. I know that if we have more modalities of MRI, so things like flare or SWE within those first few weeks might be better able to capture some of the lesions. Um, and so I think my work at the moment is focusing only on what we can use with T1 images. So that's why my presentation is kind of biased towards that. Um, but what I'm trying to do is show what we can discover from T1 weighted MRI only, and then when we how we can build it with um, other MRI modalities after that. So um, in short, yes, I do think they would, um, but I haven't sort of investigated um, which ones would be better suited for acute versus chronic lesions. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question asks, um, so the results are based on, on structural imaging. Have you looked at any functional? Are there any techniques being used in the clinical arena? And, and how do you think artificial intelligence may be added into these approaches? Yeah, I definitely think artificial intelligence is the way to go. And I think that where TBI research is really sort of falling behind in terms of the improvements that have been made uh, for stroke lesions and for multiple sclerosis lesions is that um, in stroke lesions, certainly from what I've read, they've had these huge data sets of stroke lesions that have been expertly manually segmented, and then they're able to train their lesion classification procedures on those manually created data sets. Um, but we don't have anything like that yet for TBI. So we're trying to take these automated lesion segmentation methods, some of which I didn't include in the talk today, which are, um, you know, use artificial intelligence and um, automated neural networks, which um, work much better in stroke lesion classification. But when we're trying to apply them to TBI lesions, it's just still so different to what the classifiers have been trained on that it doesn't create a good match. So I think that once we have large data sets of manually segmented TBI lesions and we can start training classifiers on them, then I think that's going to be um, a huge step forward. 
And sorry, I think I forgot the first part of the question there. Um, um, I guess I guess you're asking about um, functional, I guess, yeah. fMRI sort of, I guess I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, so again, um, some of my colleagues in the Enigma um, consortium are working more on functional imaging and what we can do there. So I know that many of the registration, um, like the co-registration improvements will um, help to improve fMRI alignment, but I'm not a functional um, kind of expert. And so we are kind of, I guess, dividing the work within the Enigma consortium. So I'm trying to focus on the T1 weighted MRI. And then I do have other colleagues focusing on diffusion and um, functional, and we're going to try to kind of bring them all together. Um, so the next question is from um, Ramesh Ragapathy, and he's a great talk, congratulating on a great talk, and asks if um, anybody's looking into pediatric TBI, where lesion types can change over time and measurements might be more complicated. Yeah, definitely. So um, within Enigma, there's two working groups. One is the adult moderate severe TBI and one is the pediatric. So within the data that I have to work with in my PhD, there's certainly um, a large number of pediatric um, patients. And something that's yeah we're definitely looking into is um, how those um, lesions and pathology changes over time in paediatric versus adults. Um, and we're looking to employ kind of methods of um, or modeling injury spread in paediatric patients, especially. Um, but one thing that we can't capture is the sensitivity required of the morphological changes um, in those models of um, injury spread, we can't really capture those sensitively enough unless we improve this image pre-processing. So I'm kind of at that stage where, yeah, trying to, um, you know, choose our best pipeline, um, which is what we're working on now from what I've presented today. So we're trying to make a choice on what we're going to do to try to improve things to then run um, the analysis in my PhD. Um, and so Jana Harris has an interesting question where she asks, so she says, I see very few animal MRI studies in TBI adopting these methods you described. And could you speak to maybe some of the barriers for using these methods in animal TBI hmm. studies using MRI? Um, yeah, and I need to admit that I'm not, um, I guess, as much across the animal TBI literature um, as I am uh, on the human side. But I think one of the... Um, I guess one of the main things in animal TBI, I was under the impression that we have these great neuroanatomical atlases, which we know are, are correct. Um, and I think that then when we're dealing with MRI in animals, the registration processes are, I think, a little bit easier. Um, whereas in humans, it's just so much more varied, which is why we come into a lot more issues. Um, but I could be incorrect on that. So if anyone's an animal TBI, imaging expert, then I'd welcome them to jump on board with that question. Um, thank, thanks so much for the answer. So those are our two questions and we are past our, our time a couple minutes. Um, so thanks so much everyone for getting up early <laughs> right. there and, and it, was a, it was a great talk and thanks for sharing thanks. your research with us.